What does $200 million buy in today's military? Not a fleet of jets or an advanced warship, but one extraordinary drone. This is not an average flying robot. It is a game changer that can stay in the air longer, see farther, and do more than anything that came before it. While most aircraft need to land after a few hours, this drone can circle the earth twice without ever touching the ground. Why would the military spend this much on a single drone? And what makes this particular aircraft so valuable that it costs more than a town? Join us as we explore the RQ-4 UAV, a groundbreaking aerial powerhouse redefining surveillance, intelligence, and global defense strategies. The Northrop Grumman Global Hawk represents a significant advancement in unmanned aerial surveillance technology. The aircraft specializes in extended duration reconnaissance missions, utilizing sophisticated synthetic aperture radar systems and electro-optical infrared sensors. The United States Air Force operates the Global Hawk as part of its fleet. These planes can fly very high and stay up there for hours, making them perfect for gathering information that helps military operations worldwide. However, the program ended up costing way more than planned. Initially, the Air Force wanted to buy 63 planes, but had to cut that down to 45. Each plane started out costing $10 million in 1994, but by 2001, that price jumped to nearly $61 million per plane. By 2013, each cost over $131 million. Because of these high costs, they considered grounding 21 of their unique intelligence gathering models in 2013. The Air Force worked on two robot planes in the 90s to gather intelligence. They had the Dark Star, made by Lockheed Martin, designed to fly without being detected. Their other option was the Global Hawk. When money got tight, they had to pick just one. They went with the Global Hawk because it could fly farther and carry more equipment, even though it was not as stealthy as the Dark Star. They needed the planes to give them an advantage in the Middle East. So the Air Force did not wait for all the testing to finish. They sent these early models straight to Afghanistan to help with the war effort. That is pretty unusual, as usually they would wait until all the testing was done. They built nine more improved versions called Block 10 aircraft. Two of these went to the Navy and they sent another two to Iraq to help. They delivered the last Block 10 plane in 2006. The Global Hawk got an upgrade. Engineers made the nose longer and stretched out the wings. This new version, called Block 20, could carry 3,000 pounds of gear, a big improvement over the original. Northrop Grumman unveiled its upgraded Global Hawk in the year 2006, the 17th one they had built. The plane took its first test flight in 2007, going from Palmdale to Edwards Air Force Base in California. They spent 2008 putting it through its paces, ensuring the improvements worked as planned. The Navy wanted to see if the Global Hawk could work over oceans, so they got two Block 10 planes to test. They named them N1 and N2. They did some quick tests at Edwards Air Force Base. Then in 2006, they moved the first plane to their testing site at Patuxent River. A special Navy test group called VX-20 took charge of trying out these maritime patrol versions. The Global Hawk Maritime Demonstration aircraft first appeared at RIMPAC, a major naval exercise near Hawaii, in July 2006. The drone flew from Point Mugu Naval Base in California, making four round trips of about 2,500 miles each way. During its 24 hours in the air, it worked closely with two ships, the USS Abraham Lincoln, an aircraft carrier, and the USS Bonhomme Richard, an amphibious assault ship. The Global Hawk's mission was clear. Watch the oceans, monitor ships, and take photos during exercises. All the images were sent to Patuxent River Naval Air Station for analysis before being sent to Navy ships near Hawaii. Northrop Grumman saw an opportunity and entered their RQ-4B drone in a Navy competition for a new surveillance aircraft. It paid off. In April 2008, they won a contract worth $1,160,000,000. The Navy first called it the RQ-4N, but in 2010, they gave it a new name, the MQ-4C. While the Navy's MQ-4C Triton and Air Force RQ-4 look alike, they serve different purposes. The Air Force model stays at high altitudes, but the Navy's Triton is more flexible. It can fly at 50,000 feet to search large areas, then drop to 10,000 feet to get a better view of what it finds. This unique flight pattern meant the Triton needed special wings. Though they might look like the Air Force version's wings from the outside, 
They are much more challenging on the inside. They are also built to handle ice, physical damage, and lightning. Features the Air Force model doesn't need since it stays high in the sky. On June 17, 2022, the Navy wrapped up a mission that went way longer than planned. They had brought home their last RQ-4 ABAMS D drone from the Middle East. What started as a six-month test turned into a 13-year operation. The Navy had bought five Block 10 drones, keeping at least one in the Persian Gulf area since 2009. Over the years, they flew 2,069 missions, logging 42,500 hours in the air. They lost two drones, one crashed, and Iran shot down another. Now the Navy has switched to using the newer MQ-4C instead. The Global Hawk program ran into financial trouble in mid-2006, when cost per aircraft jumped 25% higher than expected. This happened because they had to fix design problems and add new features. Congress wasn't happy about the rising costs and threatened to shut down the program if they couldn't prove it was worth the money for national security. To save the project, they reorganized everything in June 2006. The Air Force was supposed to finish testing the drone in 2005, but had to push that back to 2007 because of delays in building and developing it. When they finally released their test report in March 2007, they also decided to stretch out production of 54 aircraft until 2015. The Global Hawk ran into big money problems in mid-2006. Each drone cost 25% more than planned because they needed fixes and upgrades. Congress was not pleased about spending more money and said they might cancel the whole thing if it was not helping national security. To keep the program alive, they made significant changes that June. Testing fell behind schedule too. The Air Force could not finish their review in 2005 as planned. They had to wait until 2007 because building and developing the drones took longer than expected. When they finally finished testing in March 2007, they spread out the work. They'd now build 54 drones over a longer time, finishing in 2015. In early 2011, the Air Force faced a tough choice about the Global Hawk program. They cut their order of Block 40 drones from 22 to 11 to reduce costs. Then things got interesting. That June, the Pentagon's testing team reported problems with the RQ-4B. It was not performing well enough. But in a surprising twist, that same month, the Secretary of Defense declared the Global Hawk essential for national security. They said a few key things. No other aircraft could do the same job for less money, it saved $220 million per year compared to the U-2 spy plane. It could carry more sensors than the U-2 at once. And if they had to cut spending somewhere else to keep it going, they would. In early 2012, the Pentagon shook things up with its drone plans. They dropped the Global Hawk Block 30. It was eating up too much money, and its sensors were not as sharp as those on the older U-2 spy plane. Instead, they focused on buying more of the newer Block 40 model. The Air Force wanted to retire all their Block 30s, but Congress had other ideas. They told the Air Force to keep flying these drones until at least late 2014. By 2013, the Air Force wanted to buy 45 RQ-4B Global Hawks. However, swapping out the U-2 spy plane for these drones raised some worries. General Mike Hostage, who ran Air Combat Command until 2014, warned that military commanders would have to settle for gear that was only 90% as good and deal with that for eight years. Running the Global Hawk became much cheaper between 2010 and 2013. The cost for each flight hour dropped from $40,600 to $18,900. Much of this saving came from contractor support costs falling from $25,000 to $11,000 per hour. Flying the drones more often helped spread out these support costs. By 2015, the Air Force wanted to retire all U-2s by 2019. But Lockheed Martin, who made the U-2, said their plane could fly until 2050. The plans for these spy planes kept changing. In early 2018, the Air Force put off retiring the U-2 without setting a new date. Then, in 2020, their budget papers were confused by suggesting the U-2 might stop flying in 2025. The Air Force had to step in and clear things up. They were not planning to retire it at all. But here's the twist. In the summer of 2022, they announced they would retire the Global Hawk by 2027 instead. Germany's Air Force ordered a special version of the Romeo Quebec 4 Bravo drone 
called the Eurohawk. They wanted to use it to replace their old Atlantique spy planes, which were part of their Navy's air fleet. This new drone would be packed with special sensors made by European Aeronautic Defense and Space Company, six mounted on the wings. The sensors could detect electronic signals and gather intelligence. They were built to be portable. If needed, they could be moved to other aircraft, including ones flown by pilots. The Eurohawk took off for the first time in 2010, not long after they showed it to the public. After a series of test flights at Edwards Air Force Base in California, it made the long journey to Germany in July 2011. The Germans had a clear goal, outfit the drone with specialized spy sensors and get their crews trained on this new piece of equipment. This was meant to be the first of several Eurohawks for Germany's military, though things didn't quite work out that way. But things got messy. Germany's defense ministry knew in 2011 that getting permission to fly in European airspace would be tricky. The drone had problems with its controls, and Northrop Grumman, who made it, would not share critical technical details that Germany needed to check if it was safe to fly. The German Air Force still hoped to give the drone to their 51st Reconnaissance Wing, but these problems were starting to pile up. German media broke a big story in May 2013. The Eurohawk couldn't get approved to fly in Europe, or any country following international rules. The problem? It did not have a system to avoid crashing into other aircraft. Fixing this would cost over 600 million euros, about 780 million US dollars. And here's the kicker. Even after spending all that money, there was no guarantee it would pass inspection. Germany pulled the plug on the whole program two days after the news broke. The story took a wild turn. In 2012, Germany's defense minister, Thomas de Maizière was all in on the Eurohawk, but a year later he did a complete flip and told Parliament the project was an endless nightmare. The government had burned through 562 million euros before shutting it down. But that was not the end of the story. Northrop Grumman and EDS fought back against the decision. They said the media misunderstood the control issues and the high costs. They even made a bold offer. They would finish testing the first drone and build four more, promising to keep costs under control. The Eurohawk pulled off something remarkable. In August 2013, it stayed in the air for more than 25 hours without stopping, reaching 58,600 feet high. No other unmanned aircraft that heavy had ever flown that long in Europe without needing more fuel. President Obama set aside $10 million in 2014 to see if they could move the U-2's advanced sensors to the Global Hawk drone. Northrop Grumman gave it a shot the following year. They took two necessary sensors from the U-2, the optical bar camera, and one called Sires, and got them working on the drone. It worked so well that they thought they could do the same upgrade to all their Global Hawks. By July 2015, everything was set. The Air Force and Northrop Grumman decided to try out two drones with these sensors. They had to add 17 special mounts and change the drone's bottom cover to make it all fit. After tweaking the software, the new design could hold 540 kilos of sensors in a canoe-shaped bay underneath. Northrop Grumman was not done yet. They planned to add another sensor called the MS-177 to the Global Hawk. This new sensor worked well on the E-8C J-STARS plane and would replace the older Sires II. Thanks to a rotating camera mount, it could spot things better and see more around it. In February 2016, they proved they were on the right track when the drone flew successfully with the older Sires II sensor. Raytheon built special defenses for the drone. They added sensors that could tell if someone was trying to track it with lasers or radar. They also gave it jamming gear and a decoy it could pull behind it. The Global Hawk is starting a second career. Instead of flying combat missions, it's being turned into something called a Range Hawk to help test hypersonic missiles. It's a complete change of mission. Now these drones will look up at missiles flying overhead instead of down at the ground. The Pentagon is adding new sensors and moving equipment to track these super fast missiles. 24 older drones are being converted, four block 20 and 20 block 30 models. The switch is already working well. The modified block 10 range hawks help test hypersonic weapons 10 times in 2023. They even managed two tests 10 days apart, one over the Atlantic and another over the Pacific. The Global Hawk is not just one drone, but a system with two main parts. First, the RQ-4 aircraft carries all the sensors and communication gear. 
Then there's the ground control, split in two. One team handles takeoff and landing, while another runs the actual mission. The RQ-4 runs on a Rolls-Royce turbofan engine that puts out 7,050 pounds of thrust. It can carry up to 2,000 pounds of equipment. The body is made from aluminum with a V-shaped tail, and the wings are built from strong composite materials. The Global Hawk started with a model called the RQ-4A Block 10. This first version could carry 2,000 pounds of gear, including radar, regular cameras, and infrared sensors for taking detailed pictures. The military built seven, but stopped using them by 2011. The first production model was the RQ-4A, made for the United States Air Force. 16 of these aircraft were built in total. The later RQ-4B version had several improvements, notably a larger payload capacity. Its wingspan was extended to 130.9 feet, 39.9 meters, and its length grew to 47.7 feet, 14.5 meters. These size and payload increases did come with a trade-off, though. The aircraft's range dropped to 8,700 nautical miles, 16,100 kilometers. NATO developed the RQ-4D Phoenix specifically for its Alliance ground surveillance program. Germany created the RQ-4E Eurohawk version, building on the RQ-4B design, but adding special EADs equipment for gathering intelligence signals. While Germany planned to buy five Eurohawks, they scrapped the program in May 2013 after getting just one aircraft. The MQ-4C Triton, previously known as the RQ-4N, was developed for the United States Navy to handle broad maritime surveillance. The Navy has ordered four and plans to get 68 of them eventually. The EQ-4B variant is equipped with special communications gear called the Battlefield Airborne Communications Node System, or BAC. Finally, a proposed KQX version would have worked as a self-flying refueling tanker, though this never reached the planning stage. These upgrades show how the Global Hawk kept getting better at its job. It was adapted to meet new military needs, from taking pictures to relaying messages. The switch from a 2,000-pound to a 3,000-pound payload meant it could carry more advanced gear, making it more useful in more situations. Thanks for watching. While you are still here, click on the link on your screen to check out another of our videos. See you there.